Hello everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Katina Nikolopoulou. I'm uh, from Sivnet Greece Cyprus. Uh, it's so glad to see so many of you being here in the final event of Urban Transports, uh, the Mediterranean Mobility Forum. Uh, I'm not going to bore you by saying a lot because we have so many amazing speakers to do that. Uh, so uh, I'm well, uh, I want to welcome Mr. Kosmas Anagrostopoulos, the, ma the Managing Director of Sivnet Greece Cyprus, for, to be the one to welcome all of you here. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Athens. Uh, I would like you use to, to use your headphones because I'm going to speak in Greek to one of the Greek cities that are participating in this conference. Uh, so I give you two seconds to wear your headphones. And now you will hear uh, how is good morning uh, in Greek. Perhaps most of you already know this. So it's uh, Kalimera. Kalimera se oles ke olus. Kalos hirtate stin Athena, si se gatastasis tis Otea Academy ya to Mediterranean Mobility Forum, to teliko sinedrio to Urban Transports Community to Idreg Med Program. Ena sinedrio pou etimazume tus telefteus exi mines, με μια μεγάλη ομάδα συνεργατών, απόλυτη σύμπραξη του έργου και εξωτερικούς συνεργάτες. Ένα συνέδριο που συμπυκνώνει και παρουσιάζει τα σημαντικότερα αποτελέσματα του έργου, που αναμφίβολα είναι τα policy briefs, το mentoring program, η Internet Euro Med Academy και η διακήρυξη του Urban Transports, όπως και άλλα τα οποία θα παρουσιαστούν στη συνέχεια από τους σχετικούς ομιλητές. Τα τέσσερα policy briefs που αφορούν την ήπια κινητικότητα, την ηλεκτροκίνηση, την κινητικότητα σε τουριστικού προορισμού και την ανθεκτική κινητικότητα στην κλιματική κρίση. Για το πρώτο από αυτά, υπεύθυνο ήταν το δίκτυό μα, το Σύμβινε τη Ελλάδα Κύπρου, όπω επίση και για το practitioner briefing για την κινητικότητα στα ελληνικά νησιά, που σύντομα θα παραδοθεί στο πρόγραμμα σε δύο γλώσσε. Το mentoring program ήταν ένα πρόγραμμα μεταφορά τεχνογνωσία με τη συμμετοχή 8 πόλεων τη Μεσογείου εκ των οποίων οι τρεις από την Ελλάδα και την Κύπρο ήταν η Λάρισα, η Παλίνη και η Λάρνακα, με μέντορα την επίκουρη καθηγήτρια του Πανεπιστημίου Πατρών Ζωή Χριστοφόρου και με άλλες τρεις ελληνικές πόλεις που έδωσαν τα φώτα τους στις υπόλοιπες, τη Θεσσαλονίκη, την Εγουμενίτσα και το Ρέθιμνο. Το Indirect Hero Med Academy ήταν ένα πρόγρα... είναι ένα πρόγραμμα e-learning με 9 courses, εκ των οποίων το Sustainable Tourism and Mobility for the Mediterranean Σχεδιάστηκε και υλοποιήθηκε από το δίκτυό μα σε συνεργασία με την ερευνήτρια του Πανεπιστημίου Αιγαίου, την Ιωάννα Παγόνη. Τέλο, η διακήρυξη του Urban Transports με πάνω από 30 υπογράφουσε πόλει, και είμαστε πολύ περήφανοι γι' αυτό, οι περισσότερε εξ αυτών από την Ελλάδα. Ένα συνέδριο που είναι πιο επίκαιρο από ποτέ άλλοτε. Καθώ υλοποιείται σε μια ευρωπαϊκή χώρα που μαστίζεται από διαρκεί κρίση εδώ και πάρα πολλά χρόνια. Οικονομική κρίση, κοινωνική κρίση, η κρίση της πανδημίας που ακόμα δεν έχει ξεπεραστεί πλήρως, η κλιματική κρίση και η ενεργειακή προσφάτως, σε μια Ευρώπη και σε ένα πλανήτη που αντιμετωπίζει επίσης πολύ σημαντικές προκλήσεις, απόλυτα συνηθισμένες με τις αστικές μεταφορές και την κινητικότητα ανθρώπων και αγαθών. Είναι όμως και επίκαιρο το συνέδριο από μια θετική πλευρά, καθώς στην Ελλάδα αυτή τη στιγμή διεξάγεται ένας οργασμός σχεδίων και χρηματοδοτήσεων για τα σχέδια βιώσιμης αστικής κινητικότητας, την ηλεκτροκίνηση, τη μικροκινητικότητα, την προσβασιμότητα, τις αναπλάσεις και τον χωρικό σχεδιασμό. Όλο και περισσότερες ελληνικές πόλεις, πόλεις του δικτύου Σύμπινετ Ελλάδας Κύπρου, πλέον συμμετέχουν σε ευρωπαϊκά και εθνικά έργα καινοτομία όλο και περισσότερες πόλεις του δικτύου μας προχωρούν σε ριζοσπαστικές αλλαγές στον τομέα της κινητικότητας, οι οποίες φέρουν σημαντικά αποτελέσματα. Αποτελέσματα που τα βλέπουμε στην καθημερινή ζωή. Τα βλέπουν οι ίδιοι οι πολίτες, οι δημότες από τον πόλεο. Ως συντονιστής του δικτύου Σίβινετ, οφείλω να αναφέρω ότι ο πρώτος κύκλος της συμμετοχής του δικτύου μας στο πρόγραμμα κάπου εδώ κλείνει, χωρίς να είμαστε σε θέση ακόμα να πούμε περισσότερα για τη συνέχεια. Αυτό που όμως εμείς κρατάμε ως συμπέρασμα από την συμμετοχή ε, του δικτύου μας στο πρόγραμμα είναι ότι με κατάλληλη συνεργασία, συνεννόηση, αφοσίωση και ειλικρίνεια 
Οι στόχοι που μπορούμε να πετύχουμε είναι συχνά υψηλότεροι από αυτού που είχαμε αρχικά θέσει. Αυτό είναι ακριβώ που χρειάζονται οι ευρωπαϊκέ πόλει και οι τοπικέ κοινωνίε του, και ιδιαίτερα αυτέ τη Μεσογείου. Και είναι στο χέρι του να το πετύχουν. Επειδή αργότερα δεν θα έχω την ευκαιρία, θέλω από αυτό εδώ το βήμα να ευχαριστήσω θερμά καταρχά όλου εσά που αφαιρώσετε τον πολύτιμο χρόνο σα για να μάθετε για το έργο και βρίσκεστε σήμερα εδώ μαζί μα και ιδιαίτερα του εκπροσώπους πόλεων και από την ελληνική περιφέρεια αλλά και από τι άλλε χώρε τη Μεσογείου της Ευρωπαϊκής αλλά και της υπόλοιπης Μεσογείου, που αγαπάμε ιδιαίτερα εμείς εδώ στην Ελλάδα. Θέλω να ευχαριστήσω προσωπικά την Project Officer του έργου, Lidwin Lafontaine, εκ μέρους της Joint Secretariat του Intergmed, για την καθημερινή υποστήριξη της δουλειά μας στο έργο επί τρία χρόνια και για τη διασφάλιση ενός άρτιου αποτελέσματος που αποτελεί σημαντική παρακαταθήκη για το πρόγραμμα. Θέλω να ευχαριστήσω όλη τη σύμπραξη του έργου για τη σκληρή δουλειά και την παρουσία του εδώ σήμερα και ιδιαίτερα το lead partner των οργανισμών MedCities, την project coordinator Λάια Βινιέ Μαρσέ, τον Οριόλ Μπάρμπα και τον Τζοζεπ Κανάρη. Θέλω να ευχαριστήσω όλη την ομάδα του Civinet για την αφοσίωση που επέδειξε στο έργο και για τη διοργάνωση του σημερινού συνεδρίου, και ιδιαίτερα την Κατερίνα Νικολοπούλου, τον Χρήστο Το Γιολδάση, τη Ματίνα Μελά, τη Γαριφαλιά Λιάπη και τον Νίκο Ανανιάδη. Θέλω επίση να ευχαριστήσω όλου του εξωτερικού συνεργάτε που φρόντισαν ώστε το έργο να ελοπιθεί άρτια, εμπρόθεσμα και με υψηλή ποιότητα, και ιδιαίτερα την ομάδα τη ΣΟΤΕ Academy και τον Γιάννη τον Αργυράκο, το Πανεπιστήμιο Πατρών και τη Ζωή Χριστοφόρου, το Πανεπιστήμιο Αιγαίου και την Ιωάννα Παγόνη. Επίση θέλω να ευχαριστήσω θερμά όλη την Πολιτική Επιτροπή του Σίβινετ και ιδιαίτερα την πρόεδρό μα Μαρία Ανδρούτσου, που στήριξε και διέδωσε τα σημαντικά μηνύματα του έργου προ την τοπική αυτοδιοίκηση τη Ελλάδα με αποτέλεσμα να μετράμε σήμερα 30 ελληνικές πόλεις που υπέγραψαν τη διακήρυξη του Urban Transports. Και τέλος, θέλω να ευχαριστήσω θερμά την οικογένεια του Σίβιτας και ιδιαίτερα τον Αντιπρόεδρο Γρηγόρη Κωνσταντέλο, καλή ήρθατε κύριε Αντιπρόεδρε, το μέλος του Σίβιτας ΠΑΚ Γιώργη Μαρινάκη και το συντονιστή του Σίβιτας Elevate Fred Dotter που στέκονται δίπλα μας σε όλες τις σημαντικές στιγμές του δικτύου, τις χαρούμενες αλλά και τις δύσκολε. Γιατί χωρί ενότητα, συνεργασία και αλληλεγγύη, τίποτα σημαντικό δεν μπορεί να συμβεί ούτε στον τομέα τη βιώσιμη κινητικότητα, ούτε γενικώ στη ζωή. Σα εύχομαι ένα όμορφο διήμερο και σα ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Next in line is uh, Mr. Josep Canals, the General Secretary from Med City, our lead partner. Unfortunately, He wasn't able to be here with us today, so let's watch a, a small video. Hello, good morning, how are you? Uh, first of all, let me tell you that I would like very much to be with you there, but it's not possible because of personal uh, affairs. But uh, I am very, very well represented by all the team of MedCities, the leader of this great family that is the Urban Trust community very well represented by Laia Vinas, Uriol Barba, and Mark Zea. Thank you very much to all of you, to all the, the stakeholders, all the, the, the partners of, of this project, uh, Unimed, Sivinet, RSN Spark, Kodatu, Polis, and the municipality of Duras, which is a member of the cities. You've been doing for more than five years uh, a great work. Thank you very much for all of that. You have shown that uh, It's possible to work and to create a new way of mobility, uh, soft and sustainable mobility. Uh, for me, a sustainable mobility is that that is centered on, on people, centered on human rights, and on, on human mobility. Uh, it's a way of democratizing. The, the car is not the majority of the mobility. So if, when we focus uh, with the pedestrian, with the bicycles, uh, with the public transportation, and when the, this mobility has to be done with motors in an electrical way, when we do all of this multimodal thing together, we are improving our cities. You know that mobility is one of the great emitters, the responsibles of the, the emissions of CO2, uh, gas, greenhouse emissions, and all the pollutants. So by working in, in this mobility, we are improving uh, our cities. So thank you very much. Uh, I want to highlight uh, some of the products that you have done. I always show this uh, book 
wherever I go and I have to explain what this city is doing. So uh, concrete, tangible products, and other intangible also in, in, in online products, but a lot of knowledge that you have uh, summarized, that you have shown, that you have proven that, uh, that are right, that can be done, that can be, and, then, and that must be replicated. So uh, this is a lot of work. Um, and also I want to highlight all the stakeholders involved, all the, the, the territories, but the 45 uh, political recommendations that uh, you have, we were presenting in Brussels and, and today, with you in this today's session. So uh, very, very important uh, that this next phase, and as I said, is not the, the end, is the commencing of replicating, of uh, making diffusion, communicating all these results. And from here, I want to say that Mitsuti is committed in uh, presenting all these recommendations uh, next month uh, on, um, in the Parliament of Catalonia. Mitsuti is based in Barcelona, the capital of Catalonia. So we will be presenting these results in front of the deputies, um, different, different groups of the Parliament of Catalonia, for them to choose how can they improve the laws and the rules of the, of the country of Catalonia to, uh, to the, uh, a better uh, urban and soft sustainable mobility. And also, uh, we will send all the recommendations to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean that encompasses all the state parliaments of the Mediterranean and that they, they will be hopefully a Mercedes member next month. So all this work is this new phase to replicate, to, the, to, to make the, the dissemination of this knowledge as we did in the InterRecMed Academy. Thank you very much. I hope that this today's session will be very fruitful and I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. We are working for improving uh, our planet and our cities. That is not a minor thing. Thank you very much. Uh, we will continue now with Ms. Uh, Ludwin Lafontaine from the Joint Secretariat of the Interreg Med. Thank you so much for being here with us. Well, um, good morning, but also so bonjour, since I heard a lot of French uh, speaking around. So just know that later on we can exchange in French easily, okay? Um, so I received two thanks this morning, thank you. But um, as you see, I think that this is the kind of projects we have to thank, because as we take stock of three years of hard work, dedicated to the valorization of achievements and a complex adventure of creating impact, transferring results and integrating them into public policy. It's really important to, uh, to remember that UTC, which brings together the urban transport community of projects, is really part of a bold gamble by the program uh, to capitalize the results and that the success of the projects is due to its ability to adapt and persevere, as this type of projects had no previous history. You know, that horizontal projects were something brand new and we really worked hand in hand with the projects and it was not always easy to understand what the programs wanted to achieve with these types of projects and this is, you know, really a thank because along the way, I mean, it's three years, but there was three years before also, so it's six years total we're building a community of projects and working to achieve collective uh, transfer and uh, capitalization was not an easy task because even the program didn't know where, how it would really happen. But we knew that we had to give the means and the means were the horizontal projects. So. And so the first idea of the Joint Secretariat today is to highlight the patience and willingness of these projects that we so-called horizontal projects to follow the program in its innovations and also go beyond the comfort zone of the usual projects because that was not usual projects. And thanks to this experience, uh, the efforts made and the feedback, the program could imagine uh, going even further to propose a next generation of governance projects through which it will keep supporting the commitment of cities in projects to exchange and integrate innovation in public policies to contribute to a climate-neutral society. While the upcoming governance projects are part of a strategy for amplification of results and be counted on as a form of continuity in the work that has been carried so far. So indeed, the upcoming 
2021 and 2027 period will build upon the result of the 2014-2020 period through a similar approach that combines complementarity and contribution to higher level objectives. So we have four missions in which the thematic projects will be um, uh, all gathered to, uh, to achieve higher uh, or, or objectives of higher importance. So concretely, so far, four governance projects have been already selected, among which thematic community projects on green living areas and thematic community projects on sustainable tourism, uh, where the cities and the mobility will find most particularly their place. Uh, and these activities will start in January 2023. Um, in the work that will continue, there will be notably and transversally to all governance projects, the continuity and the involvement of the Euromed Academy, as well as a more coordinated work with the Joint Secretariat to support the projects in their transfer and mainstreaming process by developing at the program level strong working relationships that we call also liaising relations with, uh, we, we, we spoke just, uh, just now about the, the, the parliaments, the European parliaments. We also have the, the, um, the, the different DGs, the different uh, initiatives um, over the Mediterranean. Um, so the, the GES is already working with establishing strong relations, working relations to assure that uh, when you have something that you want to be heard, and to, to give you more visibility, we can count also on this uh, already foreseen relations and agreements that we have to, uh, uh, to amplify the results that all the projects together will achieve. So definitely we look forward to continuing this adventure and extending also the duration of the results through this collective effort, because this is what it is, it's a collective effort compared to what we had in the past where we had just different projects working in the same directions, but not really communicating or coordinating. So um, now the cooperation is able to show its results, but this is important to improve the coordination and governance of cooperation. So this is the main challenge of the new period. So it's just amplifying and just passing just the coordination, the, 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 the cooperations, but coordinating among cooperation uh, teams. So, well, I hope that we'll be there to follow you in this adventure. Uh, and now uh, we have Mrs. Uh, Miss Elena Kudura, a Greek, mem a Greek member uh, of uh, the European Parliament. Σας ακούμε, κυρία Κουντουρά. Ωραία, ευχαριστώ. Αγαπητές φίλες και φίλοι, ε, καταρχήν ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την πρόσκληση να δώσω συγχαρητήρια για αυτή την πολύ ωραία κοτοπία. Ε, γιατί όλα αυτά τα θέματα που συζητάμε είναι θέματα που μας αφορούν όλους. Ως εκτομπληκτής και με τις αυξημένες αυτοδιότητες που έχω στην Επιτροπή μεταφορών του τουρισμού Τραμ, ως συντονίστρια της πολιτικής μου ομάδας με ιδιαίτερη χαρά συμμετέχω, για να σας ενημερώσω σχετικά με τις προτεραιότητές μας στο Ευρωπαϊκό Κοινοπουργείο στα ζητήματα που συνδέονται με τη βιώσιμη αστική κινητικότητα. Οι μεταφορές ευθύνονται για το 27% περίπου των εκπομπών αερίου του Θεοκοπηρίου στην Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση. Για να επιτευχθούν λοιπόν η φιλόδοξη κλιματική στόχη στο πλαίσιο της πράσινης συμφωνίας, οι εκπομπές άνθρακα στον τομέα των μεταφορών πρέπει να μισθούν δραστικά κατά 90% μέχρι το 2050. Πρόκειται για μια ιστορικό διαστάσεων διαδικασία, καθόλου εύκολη για όλη την Ευρώπη και φυσικά για την περιοχή τη Μεσογείου και ιδιαίτερα για τι πόλει και του τουριστικού μα προορισμού. Είναι όμω απολύτω αναγκαία για να εξασφαλιστεί η πράσινη μετάφραση και επειδή θα συμβάλλει στη βελτίωση τη υγεία και τη ποιότητα τη ζωή μα. Εκατοντάδε χιλιάδε πολίτε πεθαίνουν κάθε χρόνο από την ατμοσφαιρική ρήπανση στα αστικά κέντρα. Θα σταθώ στον κέντρο ρόλο των βιώσιμων εναλλακτικών καυσίμων και ιδιαίτερα τη ηλεκτροκίνηση. Την προηγούμενη εβδομάδα υιοθετήσαμε στην Ολομέλεια του Ευρωπαϊκού Κοινοβουλίου το ψήφισμά μα για τον επικείμενο κανονισμό για την ανάπτυξη υποδομών εναλλακτικών καυσίμων.
Simon Αφίλ. Είναι η ονομασία που είναι κομμάτι του νομοθετικού πακέτου Fit for 55. Πρόκειται για το πιο ισχυρό και συνεχτικό με το σήμερα ευρωπαϊκό πλαίσιο που ορίζει νομικά δεσμευτικέ ελάχιστε αποκτήσει για τα κράτη-μέλη στην ανάπτυξη των αναγκαίων υποδομών και εναλλακτικών καυσίμων και αποσχοπεί στη δημιουργία ενό πλήρου διασυνδεδεμένου και διαλειτουργικού δικτύου σε ολόκληρη την Ευρώπη. Αυτό που ζητήσαμε επιτακτικά μεταξύ άλλων. Είναι η επάρκεια σταθμών φόρτιση ηλεκτρικών οχημάτων στα οδικά δικτύα, τουλάχιστον 60 χιλιόμετρα, αλλά και μέσα στον αστικό ιστό. Σε πολύ σύγχρονα στα σημεία για του πολίτε, καθώ και για επαγγελματικέ ομάδε που εκτελούν μεταφορικό έργο όπω είναι τα ταξί. Η επένδυση σε αυτέ τι υποδομέ είναι απαραίτητη για την ομαλή μετάβασή μα στην ηλεκτροκίνηση, στην καθημερινότητά μα, αλλά και για να αντέξει το σύστημα μεταφορών. Στι μεγάλε δομικέ αλλαγέ που θα συμβούν. Θα αναφερθώ επίση στι προτάσει μα για την αστική κινητικότητα, η οποία θα αλλάξει δραματικά τα επόμενα χρόνια, σε συνδυασμό με το κρίσιμο ζήτημα τη οδική ασφάλεια. Η απώλεια ζώων καθημερινά στου ευρωπαϊκού δρόμου είναι μια γενοκτονία διαρκή. Είχα την τιμή να είμαι συγκίτρια του Ευρωπαϊκού Κοινοβουλίου στην έκθεση ψήφισμα για το πλαίσιο πολιτική τη Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση για την οδική ασφάλεια. Έω το 2030. Η έκθεση αυτή αποτελεί τον οδικό χάρτη του Ευρωπαϊκού Κοινοβουλίου για το πώ θα μειώσουμε κατά 50% του θανάτου και για πρώτη φορά και του σοβαρού τραυματισμού από τροχέ ηλικούση μέχρι το τέλο τη δεκαετία. Προτείνουμε λοιπόν ένα φιλόδοξο αλλά απόλυτα ρεαλιστικό σχέδιο για πιο ασφαλή οχήματα, πιο ασφαλή υποδομέ, πιο ασφαλή χρήση του οδικού δικτύου. Και ένα ισχυρό πλαίσιο πολιτική για το μέλλον. Οι πόλει καλούνται να ανασχεδιάσουν και να αναδιανύουν το δημόσιο χώρο για τη βιώσιμη αστική κινητικότητα, με πράσινε και ευρωναλυτικέ μορφέ μεταφορών και μετακινήσεων. Χρειάζονται φυσικά πράσινε δημόσιε επικοινωνίε προσιτέ σε κόστο για όλου του πολίτε. Χρειάζεται όμω και ένα ισχυρό εκπαιδευτικό πλαίσιο που θα αντιμετωπίζει τι προκλήσει από την ταυτόχρονη κυκλοφορία. Αυτοματοποιημένων και συμβατικών οχημάτων τα επόμενα χρόνια ή την αυξημένη χρήση των συσκευών μικροκυκλικότητα όπω τα ηλεκτρικά σκούτερ. Πρέπει συγχρόνω να στρέψουμε την προσοχή μα στου ευάλωτου χρήστε του δρόμου, ποδηλάτε και πεζού, που συνεχώ τα αυξάνονται και ήδη βρίσκονται πιο εκτεθειμένοι στο κίνδυνο του συγκρούσεων. Γι' αυτό προτείνουμε την οριζόντια μείωση τη ταχύτητα στα 30 χιλιόμετρα την ώρα, οριζόντια. Πρωτίστω γιατί θα μπει τα χέρια του ξέρουμε όλοι ξόρι του ΕΣ, αλλά και επειδή θα συμβάλλει στη μείωση του αντίκτυπου των ρήπων στην ατμόσφαιρα. Σε όσε πόλει έχει εφαρμοστεί, όπω η Ισπανία στο Λιβάο, είχε πολύ μεγάλη επιτυχία. Η αναθεώρηση του κανονισμού για τα διευρωπαϊκά δίκτυα μεταφορών θα συμπεριλάβει σε μεγάλο βαθμό και την αστική κινητικότητα και τον υπεράγουν. Ω σκιώδη συγκεκριτήρια, έχω θέσει ω στόχο την ενίσχυση του κανονισμού και τη βελτίωση τη ασφάλεια και τη βιωσιμότητα τη πόλη. Χρειαζόμαστε ένα ισχυρό όραμα, διάλογο, αλλά και φιλόδοξη άμεση δράση, ώστε να αποτρέψουμε να δημιουργηθούν στο μέλλον αυτέ οι πολιτικέ προκλήσει στη βιωσιμότητα που, όπω είπα και πριν, μα αφορούν όλου. Σα ευχαριστώ πολύ. And now we will uh, continue with Ms. Uh, Maria Andruzzu, Mayor of Agios Dimitrios and the President of, uh, uh, of the Civnet Greece Cyprus. Thank you very much. Καλημέρα σε όλες και όλους. Σας ευχαριστώ θερμά για την πρόσκληση στο Mediterranean Mobility Forum στο συνέδριο που αποτελεί την επισφράγηση αυτής της δραστήριας κοινότητας που κατάφερε να χτίσει το Ιντερνετ Μεγ. Ως πρόεδρος της Πολιτικής Επιτροπής του Σίβινετ Ελλάδας-Κύπρου, χαιρετίζω τις εργασίες του συνεδρίου και ανυπομονώ να ενημερωθώ για τα αποτελέσματα και τις λύσεις που θα προταθούν μέσα από αυτό. Με έξι χρόνια επίμονης δουλειά, το Urban Transport Community, η κοινότητα που δημιουργήσατε, κατάφερε να αποτελέσει ένα ζωντανό κύτταρο γνώση, δικτύωση, ανταλλαγή τεχνογνωσία, αλλά και γιατί όχι, ένα ξεκίνημα για το σχεδιασμό πιο βιώσιμων 
κατάλληλων και αποτελεσματικών πολιτικών που θα λαμβάνουν υπόψη τους το όλον, κοινωνία, υποδομές, κλίμα, περιβάλλον, αλλά κυριότερα τις επόμενες και τις μεθεπόμενες γενιές. Οι μεσογειακές πόλεις έχουν πολλά κοινά. Περισσότερα από όλα όμως μοιραζόμαστε έναν καταπληκτικό ήλιο τις περισσότερες μέρες του χρόνου, γεγονός που κάνει ή θα έπρεπε να κάνει τους τόπους μας ελκυστικούς προορισμούς από ανθρώπους άλλων χωρών της Ευρώπης, είτε για τουρισμό, είτε για εργασία και μακροχρόνια διαμονή. Ως ένα χαρακτηριστικό της πανδημίας COVID-19, όπου αναδείχθηκε η δυνατότητα εργασίας από μακριά, οι ψηφιακοί νομάδες προτιμούν τις πόλεις μας και τα νησιά μας και αναμένεται να τις προτιμήσουν ακόμα περισσότερο λόγω της τρέχουσας ενεργειακής κρίσης. Το ελκυστικό κλίμα της Μεσογείου φαντάζει σίγουρα μια λύση στο διστοπικό χειμώνα που αναμένουμε. Αντιλαμβάνεστε λοιπόν πως όλες και όλοι εσείς μέσα από το Urban Transport Community κατορθώσατε μια σημαντική δουλειά. Μέσα από την ανάδειξη των προκλήσεων των μεσογειακών πόλεων και αστικών κέντρων ως προς την κουλτούρα αστικής μετακίνησης. Χειριστήκατε με τρόπο επιδέξιο και επικοδομητικό σειρά ζητημάτων που αφορούν στην κοινή κουλτούρα κινητικότητας των πόλεων της Μεσογείου, το σχεδιασμό μιας βιώσιμης αστικής κινητικότητας σε πόλεις που αποτελούν τουριστικούς προορισμούς και φυσικά θέσατε ξεκάθαρα τις προκλήσεις για την αστική μετακίνηση σε περιοχές που τα τελευταία χρόνια με κοινό τρόπο πλήττονται από τις συνέπειες της κλιματικής αλλαγή. Θεωρώ πως η συμμετοχή του Σίβινετ στο πρόγραμμα Interregment και συγκεκριμένα στο Urban Transport Community, αλλά και μέσω αυτού η συμμετοχή μέρους της ελληνικής τοπικής αυτοδιοίκησης, ήταν ύψη της σημασίας. Το δίκτυο Σίβινετ έχει ως μέλη 120 δήμους και 6 περιφέρειες της Ελλάδας, με πάνω από 20 εξ αυτών να έχουν μια στενή συνεργασία μαζί του τα τελευταία χρόνια. Ως εκ τούτου το Σίβινετ γνωρίζει πολύ καλά με ποιο τρόπο να διαδώσει και να εξελίξει τη γνώση που έχει παραχθεί μέσα από αυτή τη δικτύωση, συμπαρασύροντας και εμπλέκοντας ένα μεγαλύτερο μέρος ελληνικών δήμων προς λύσεις και προτάσεις που θα διαφοροποιηθούν κατά πολύ από τις μέχρι σήμερα τετριμένες πρακτικές που βασανίζουν τις πόλεις μας στα θέματα της αστικής κινητικότητας και του δημόσιου χώρου. Οι προκλήσεις για τις ελληνικές πόλεις, καθώς και οι προκλήσεις των πόλεων της Μεσογείου, και οι πιθανές λύσεις σε αυτά μας αφορούν άμεσα. Ως Δήμαρχος μιας ελληνικής πόλης θεωρώ πως μοιράζομαι κοινέ αγωνίες με συναδέλφους Δημάρχους πόλεων της Μεσογείου. Αγωνίες που αφορούν στην επαναοικιοποίηση του δημόσιου χώρου από τους ανθρώπους και το φυσικό περιβάλλον, στις παθογένειες της τρευλής αστικής ανάπτυξης των περασμένων δεκαετιών που βασανίζουν πολλές πόλεις του Νότου, αλλά και στην τεράστια ευθύνη που φέρουμε εμείς ως πολιτικά ειστάμενα πρόσωπα, όχι μόνο στο σχεδιασμό νέων βιώσιμων πολιτικών, αλλά και στην αλλαγή της κουλτούρας τόσο της δικιάς μας όσο και των πολιτών. Η πόλη στην οποία έχω την τιμή να είμαι δήμαρχος τα τελευταία 11 χρόνια, ο Άγιος Δημήτριος, έχει λάβει πολύ σημαντικά ωφέλη από το δίκτυο Σίβινετ μέχρι σήμερα και έχει προωθήσει με τη βοήθειά του σημαντικές δράσεις και πολιτικές για τις αστικές μεταφορές. Για παράδειγμα, έχουμε συνεργαστεί στην εκπόνηση του σχεδίου βιώσιμης αστικής κινητικότητας, το οποίο εκπόνηση που εξελίσσεται αυτή την περίοδο και αφορά στο μακροχρόνιο σχεδιασμό, το όραμα της πόλης μας και τη στρατηγική μας ως προς τη βιώσιμη κινητικότητα. Αλλά επίσης, σημαντική είναι και η στήριξη του δικτύου στα θέματα της εξωστρέφειας και της προσπάθειάς μας για τη διαμόρφωση μιας κουλτούρας βιωσιμότητας. Ενδεικτικά αναφέρω τη συνεπή και επίμονη συμμετοχή του Δήμου Αγίου Δημητρίου στο θεσμό της Ευρωπαϊκής Εβδομάδας Κινητικότητας, αλλά και σε διάφορα επιμέρους έργα και δράσεις ευαισθητοποίησης και συμμετοχή των πολιτών, κυρίως των παιδιών της νέας γενιάς. Σε αυτό το σημείο όμως θα ήθελα να τονίσω πως η λύση στα μεγάλα ζητήματα των βιώσιμων αστικών μετακινήσεων, των σύγχρονων πόλεων που ονειρευόμαστε, είναι στρωμένες σε ένα δρόμο εξαιρετικά δύσβατο. Αν κάτι χαρακτηρίζει την εποχή που ζούμε, είναι μια σειρά από κρίσεις. Κρίσεις που είτε διαδέχονται η μία την άλλη, είτε συμβαίνουν ταυτόχρονα και συχνά είναι αλληλοδιαπλεκόμενες ή η μία προέρχεται από την άλλη. 
Οι κρίσει αυτέ που επηρεάζουν βαθιά τι κοινωνίε σε ολόκληρο τον πλανήτη διαταράσσουν μηχανισμού και συστήματα που μέχρι σήμερα έμοιαζαν να συγκρατούν το κοινωνικό ιστό μέσα από οικουμενικέ αξίε και οράματα, αλλά κυρίω μέσα από μια συλλογική ελπίδα για πρόοδο και ανάπτυξη που σήμερα δείχνει να χάνεται. Οι συνέπειε των κρίσεων αυτών δεν είναι καν ευθείε, διαγράφουν κύκλου και διαπλέκονται σε όλα τα επίπεδα, δημιουργώντα παράλληλου και διαπλέκοντε τόπου που χρήζουν έκτακτη και επίγουσα αντιμετώπιση. Κυριότερα χαρακτηριστικά των κρίσεων αυτών είναι η απειλή, η ανασφάλεια και η αίσθηση του κατεπήγοντο, με αποτέλεσμα να υποβιβάζεται η προτεραιότητα άλλων θεμάτων. Στην ελληνική κοινωνία η πραγματικότητα μα δείχνει πως η επιθετική καθημερινότητα που βιώνουμε από αυτές τις αλληλεπάλληλες διαδοχικές ή ακόμα και ταυτόχρονες κρίσεις, συνεχώς αλλάζει την προτεραιότητα των θεμάτων, όχι μόνο στο επίπεδο της αντίληψης και ευαισθητοποίησης των ανθρώπων, αλλά και σε επίπεδο στρατηγικής, κυβερνήσεων και πολιτικών αποφάσεων. Η οικονομική κρίση των τελευταίων 12 χρόνων, η πανδημική κρίση, η προσφυγική κρίση και τελευταία η ενεργειακή, δοκιμάζει τις αντοχές του ελληνικού λαού αλλά και ολόκληρης της Ευρώπης. Αλλά πέρα και πάνω από όλα αυτά έχουμε μια σοβαρότερη απειλή να αντιμετωπίσουμε, αυτή της κλιματικής κρίσης. Η κλιματική αλλαγή όπως δεν εξελίσσεται εν κενό, αλλά συντελείται εν μέσω άλλων κινδύνων και των κρίσεων που ανέφερα, που πλήττουν σκληρά τα φτωχότερα κοινωνικά στρώματα, τα πιο περιθωριοποιημένα άτομα και κάθε είδους ευαλωτότητα, όπως είναι οι γυναίκες, τα παιδιά, τα ηλικιωμένα άτομα ή τα άτομα με αναπηρίες. Όμως οι ίδιοι άνθρωποι αυτοί δεν κατηγοριοποιούν ούτε αντιλαμβάνονται την κλιματική αλλαγή ως το πιο επίγον ή το σημαντικότερο από τα προβλήματά τους. Τα θέματα της βιώσιμης ανάπτυξης, της προστασίας του αστικού περιβάλλοντος, της ανθεκτικότητας των πόλεων, της μείωσης των εκπομπών του διοξιδίου του άνθρακα και της τεχνολογικής καινοτομία που οφείλουμε να αναδεικνύουμε πρωτίστως εμείς ως πολιτικοί, αλλά και φιλοδοξούμε να αντιμετωπίσουμε μέσα από στρατηγικό σχεδιασμό, μέσα από δράση και πρωτοβουλίε, ενδιαφέρουν τους πολίτες. Να σας απαντήσω εγώ ούτε ναι ούτε όχι, που σημαίνει πως αυτούς τους δύσκολους καιρού δεν αποτελούν την προτεραιότητά τους. Από την άλλη, πολύ συχνά συναντώ ανθρώπους που θέλουν να αλλάξουν οι πόλεις τους, να γίνουν πιο βιώσιμες, πιο συμπεριληπτικές, πιο όμορφες, πιο αναβαθμισμένες. Θέλουν όμως αυτό να συμβεί ως διαμαγείας, χωρίς να είναι διατεθειμένοι να αλλάξουν τίποτα που θα αφορά τους εαυτούς τους, τις καθημερινές τους συνήθειες, την κουλτούρα τους και την ιδιοκτησία τους. Άρα τι έχουμε... Έχουμε ανθρώπους που από τη μια αγωνίζονται για να κερδίσουν την καθημερινότητά τους και από την άλλη αντιστέκονται στις αλλαγές που πρέπει να προβούμε αν θέλουμε οι πόλεις μας να γίνουν περισσότερο βιώσιμες. Είναι δικό μας χρέος, εμείς οι άνθρωποι της πολιτικής και δι' της τοπικής αυτοδιοίκησης, να συμπεριλάβουμε σε κάθε μας σχεδιασμό όλους και όλες, με ή χωρίς αντιστάσεις. Το μέλλον δεν μπορεί να περιμένει. Είναι δική μας δουλειά να αξιοποιήσουμε στο έπακρο όλα αυτά τα νέα και καινοτόμα εργαλεία σχεδιασμού που θα μας βοηθήσουν να ανταπεξέλθουμε στις προκλήσεις της εποχής μας. Εργαλεία όπως τα σχέδια βιώσιμης αστικής κινητικότητας, τα σχέδια φόρτισης ηλεκτρικών οχημάτων, τα σχέδια αστικής προσβασιμότητας, τα τοπικά πολεοδομικά σχέδια και πολλά άλλα. Γιατί η δική μας οπτική για την κινητικότητα στις πόλεις θα πρέπει πάνω και πέρα από όλα να θέτει την ανάγκη για ένα συμπεριληπτικό σχεδιασμό έτσι ώστε όλες και όλοι να έχουν ίσα δικαιώματα και δυνατότητες και να κινούνται με ασφάλεια και αξιοπρέπεια στην πόλη. Ταυτόχρονα όμως οι πόλεις μας θα πρέπει να αντιμετωπίζονται ολιστικά. Γιατί βιώσιμο αστικό περιβάλλον σημαίνει υγιείς και ασφαλείς άνθρωποι μέσα σε αυτό. Επομένως, ο μετριασμός των επιπτώσεων της κλιματικής αλλαγής και η προσαρμογή σε αυτή θα πρέπει να αποτελούν προμετωπίδα κάθε σχεδιασμού μας. Και αυτή είναι και η δική μου παρότρινση προ όλου του συναδέλφου και όλε τι συναδέλφε στην τοπική αυτοδιοίκηση. Γιατί μόνο έτσι οι πόλει μα θα γίνουν ανθεκτικέ μέσα από βιώσιμε, ριζοσπαστικέ και μετασχηματιστικέ πολιτικέ που θα θέτουν το δημόσιο συμφέρον πάνω από το ιδιωτικό όφελο, αξιοποιώντα επιτυχημένε πρακτικέ και κεκτημένη γνώση. Γι' αυτό ακριβώ πιστεύω πω προγράμματα όπω το Ιντερνετ Μετ. Είναι ανεκτήμητη αξία για το κοινό ευρωπαϊκό μα μέλλον. Σα ευχαριστώ θερμά. Thank you very much, Ms. Andrutsu. And now I would like to welcome Mr. Grigori Kostadello, uh, the Mayor of Ari Vula Vuliagmeni and the Vice President of uh, the Policy Advisory Committee of the Civitas Community. 
Καλημέρα. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την πρόσκληση. Συγχαρητήρια στους διοργανωτές. Ήδη η... όσα έχουμε ακούσει από τους αρχικούς χαιρετισμού είναι εξαιρετικά ενδιαφέροντα. Θα ήθελα λοιπόν να ευχαριστήσω όλους σας για την πρόσκληση αλλά και την δουλειά για να οργανωθεί ένα τόσο σύνθετο και πολυεπίπεδο συνέδριο, συνάντηση, ανταλλαγή απόψεων. Να ευχηθώ καταρχάς καλή επιτυχία στο Mediterranean Mobility Forum, το οποίο σηματοδοτεί την ολοκλήρωση του Urban Transport Community Project. Όπως αναφέρθηκε νωρίτερα, λέγομαι Γρηγόρης Κωνσταντέλος, είμαι ο Δήμαρχος Βάρης Βουλας Βουλιαγμένης, ενός παραλιακού δήμου της Αθήνας. Εκτός από την ιδιότητά μου ως μέλος του Σίβινετ Ελλάδας Κύπρου, βρίσκομαι εδώ και με την ιδιότητά μου ως Αντιπροέδρου του Σίβιτας ΠΑΚ, της Πολιτικής Επιτροπής Συμβουλευτική Επιτροπή του Σίβητα. Φαντάζομαι ότι όλοι γνωρίζετε το Σίβητα, μια κοινότητα η οποία αριθμεί πάνω από 300 και πλέον ευρωπαϊκέ πόλει, που έχουν εντάξει την έξυπνη, βιώσιμη αστική κινητικότητα στον πυρήνα των πρωτοβουλειών του και ξεκίνησε με πρωτοβουλία τη Ευρωπαϊκή Επιτροπή. Το Political Advisory Committee, η Πολιτική Συμβουλευτική Επιτροπή, είναι ένα 18 εμελέ πολιτικό όργανο που εκπροσωπεί στην κοινότητα του Σίβητας, του Σίβητας τους Ευρωπαϊκούς Δήμους και κατ' επέκταση τους Ευρωπαίους Πολίτες. Είναι ένα πολιτικό όργανο συζήτησης, ανταλλαγής απόψεων και πρακτικών, προτάσεων, ενδυνάμει λύσεων, κρίσης και επίκρισης πολιτικών, οι οποίες σχεδιάζονται κεντρικά και στόχος είναι να τροφοδοτεί την Ευρωπαϊκή Επιτροπή και την Διεύθυνση Μεταφορών, τη γνωστή DigiMov, για θέματα βιώσιμης αστικής κινητικότητας και στην ουσία λειτουργεί με δύο τρόπους. Τόσο από πάνω προς τα κάτω, δηλαδή φέρνοντας στην κοινότητα του Σίβιτας αλλά και των Σίβινετ μια προσέγγιση από τι πρόκειται να έρθει από τις Βρυξέλλες, από την Ευρωπαϊκή Επιτροπή στους τομεί της κινητικότητας και των μεταφορών, αλλά και bottom up, δηλαδή από κάτω προς τα πάνω, προς τα μέλη της DigiMov, μεταφέροντας τυχόν προβλήματα, προβληματισμούς, δυσκολίες, προτάσεις ε, που χρήζουν να ληφθούν υπόψη, προβλήματα που πρέπει να, αντιμετω... να αντιμετωπιστούν και πολιτικές οι οποίες εν δυνάμει, εάν υιοθετηθούν, θα μπορέσουν να δώσουν γρήγορες, ουσιαστικές και στοχευμένες λύσεις. Ουσιαστικά, λοιπόν, αυτό το feedback το οποίο δίνεται στην πραγματικότητα είναι η προώθηση των προτάσεων των πόλεων κεντρικά στο δρόμο προς την νομοθέτηση. Κατά τη διάρκεια της ειδική μου θητείας ε, στο όργανο αυτό, είναι ιδιαίτερα ενθαρρυντικό ότι τέσσερις ελληνικές πόλεις συμμετέχουν ενεργά στην Πολιτική Επιτροπή και πολλές ακόμα στην κοινότητα του Σίβιτας ε, και ελπίζω στο μέλλον ακόμα περισσότερες ελληνικές και μεσογειακές πόλεις να γίνουν μέλη αυτής της μεγάλης οικογένειας του Σίβιτας. Για μας, για την καθημερινότητά μας, η βιώσιμη κινητικότητα είναι σε όλους τους Δήμους σε πολύ μεγάλη προτεραιότητα. Το πώς θα μετατραπούν οι πόλεις μας τα επόμενα χρόνια είναι ένα πολύ μεγάλο στοίχημα το οποίο πρέπει να κερδιθεί. Οι λύσεις υπάρχουν στο τραπέζι. Όμως καμία πόλη δεν μπορεί να πάρει ένα έτοιμο προϊόν και απλά να το εφαρμόσει γεωχωρικά στη δική του περιφέρεια. Πρέπει να προσαρμόσει αυτές τις προσπάθειες, αυτές τις προτάσεις, αυτές τις λύσεις στα χαρακτηριστικά της κάθε πόλης και τη φυσιογνωμία και των πελατών παύλα πολιτών, γιατί κάπως έτσι πλέον υπάρχει η σχέση αυτή διοίκηση και διοικούμενου, και συγχρόνως να λάβει υπόψη του ότι η βιώσιμη αστική κινητικότητα είναι ένα από τα pillars, από τους πυλώνες, αυτού που λέμε και μιλάμε άπαντες, η ανθρακική ουδετερότητα, διαχείριση απορριμμάτων, βιώσιμη αστική κινητικότητα και ενεργειακά θέματα, παραγωγή και κατανάλωση ενέργειας είναι τρία ζητήματα της καθημερινότητας των πόλεων τα οποία οφείλουμε όλοι εμείς σε τοπικό, περιφερειακό αλλά και κεντρικό επίπεδο να δώσουμε λύσεις και να προχωρήσουμε την επόμενη μέρα. Προσπαθούμε λοιπόν και με τη συζήτηση και με τις προτάσεις αλλά και με την πρακτική εφαρμογή λύσεων 
να δείξουμε το δρόμο. Να δείξουμε το δρόμο ούτως ώστε όλες οι πόλεις, τουλάχιστον της Ευρώπης και όχι μόνο, να μπορέσουμε να τρέξουμε στο ίδιο μονοπάτι το οποίο θα καταλήξει σε πραγματικό αποτέλεσμα. Οι προθέσεις πάντα είναι καλές. Το αποτέλεσμα όμως είναι αυτό το οποίο μετρά και δικαιώνει την προσπάθεια. Στην περιοχή τη δική μας που έχουμε την χαρά να επισκέπτονται πολλοί άνθρωποι οι οποίοι δεν μένουν στην περιοχή, έχουμε αναπτύξει τα τελευταία χρόνια μια σειρά από βιώσιμες λύσεις. Έχουμε κατασκευάσει πεζοδρόμους, ποδηλατοδρόμους κοντά στη θάλασσα, η οποία δημιουργεί και μια αίσθηση περιπατητική. Έχουμε εντάξει το ηλεκτρικό ποδήλατο με κοινόχρηστο σύστημα στη λειτουργία της πόλης. Έχουμε φτιάξει το πρώτο στη χώρα σύστημα κοινόχρηστων ηλεκτρικών αυτοκινήτων. Έχουμε τοποθετήσει περίπου 180 ηλεκτροφορτιστές στο παραλιακό μέτωπο και στους αστικούς λόφους της περιοχής ηλεκτροφορτιστές και τοποθετούμε αυτή την περίοδο 300 σημεία ηλεκτροφόρτισης για μακρομοπίλητη. Προσπαθούμε λοιπόν να υιοθετήσουμε προτάσεις και λύσεις ευρωπαϊκών πόλεων που έχουν περάσει αυτή τη μετάβαση και έχουν έρθει πιο κοντά στην τελική λύση. Όπως έχει υποθεί πολλές φορές, έχουμε μια πολύ μεγάλη και θα έλεγα ιερή υποχρέωση. Είτε το πολιτικό προσωπικό, είτε οι τεχνοκράτες. Έχουμε την υποχρέωση να παραδώσουμε τις πόλεις μας, τις χώρες μας, την Ήπειρό μας, τουλάχιστον στην ίδια κατάσταση, στα παιδιά μας, από τα οποία τη δανειστήκαμε. Ευχαριστώ πολύ για την προσοχή σας. Thank you, Mr. Costadelos. And last but not least, Ms. Chris Ioannou from, a city, from the city of Larnaca, a council member. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. My name is um, Christodoulos Ioannou, but feel free for the non-Greek speakers to just call me Chris. I'm sure it's easier. Um, I've been a member of the City Council of Larnaca in Cyprus for the past uh, six years, and I chair the Committee for European Programs and International Relations. And I also represent Cyprus at the European Committee of the Regions, which is the European institution uh, representing local governance across the 28, uh, 27 now member states. Um, I'm here today to share the perspective of my city in regards to urban sustainable development and our experiences to that. And for that, I'm very grateful to the, all the organizers, Civitas, uh, Met Cities, uh, for uh, organizing this very interesting event and giving us the opportunity uh, to exchange our, our views and, and our thoughts and our experiences. Uh, over this issue, we will be uh, we will have the opportunity to talk more about that in the session uh, later. So thank you again to all the organizers in front and behind the lines, to the uh, hosting organizations. Um, at least in my experience uh, as a member of the city council for the past few years, our cooperation and participation in such events has been a great catalyst in implementing change about uh, urban sustainable mobility. Our uh, mobility plan has been the result of European programs uh, that we participated, particularly through Met Cities, the network of cities that we're part of. Um, and I urge everyone to share their experiences and, and keep participating in these events and these organizations because at the end of the day, it's what allows us to bring change to our citizens and our cities. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Uh, thank you very much. And now the welcome session is, uh, is over. You know that our schedule is very full and tight, so we will uh, continue with the first session, Decarbonization of Mobility and Resilience Against Climate Change. I would like to welcome uh, Miss Alessia Giorgiuti from the Polis Network. Hi, good morning everyone. I'll keep it sweet and short. So, um, first session of today, oh, 
The first session of today is dedicated to two of the main themes of mobility, decarbonization and climate change. The two of them are intertwined. There's like, both of them have to work together for the future, for the present. And today we gathered four speakers that will um, show policy measures, case studies, and uh, presentations on different aspects that match this um, sort of correlation between the two things. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first speaker. Um, the first speaker is Carlo Federico Dallomo. He's a PhD in architecture, city and design from the University UF of Venice, so the Institute of Architecture of the University of Venice. He's been working with Interreg Italy Croatia, Interreg Italy Slovenia, and the LIFE program aimed at updating territorial governance processes for the management of climate change impacts. And today, he will give us a presentation on Mediterranean cities at the age of climate change, vulnerability assessment approaches. So, good morning, everyone. I didn't expect to be the first one, so. Um, yes, as I've been presented, I'm going to talk about urban mobility and yes, thank you so much, and climate adaptation planning. Actually, um, as you heard, I'm an architect and an urban planner, and our experience as university is basically based on designing and redesigning cities from a morphological perspective. So what we, do, what we do is actually supporting uh, local administrators, regions, municipalities, uh, and even our government in developing adaptation strategies. So at the present moment, what we do have and what we heard most of the time is uh, that we are going directly into a perfect disaster. So um, the graph on the left, maybe you know that, uh, is the RCP prediction. So the the scenarios which are telling us how bad the things are going at the present moment linking to CO2 or in general greenhouse gases emissions. The one on the right is the last EPCC report which confirms that at the present moment the situation is definitely bad. But this situation actually has as main effect not just global warming meant as a raise in temperatures which is at the present moment is kind of pleasant, um, but is going to turn all our cities, and the graph on the right um, is actually a representation of what is happening, and I must tell you that at the present moment in Venice we have 27 degrees and it's almost November, but this thing is not just about a raising in temperature, but an increasing in impacts on our territories. So if we can identify main strategies to cope with climate change and global warming, we must address the fact that global warming can be addressed through mitigation strategies, climate change impacts can be addressed through adaptation strategies. Or in some territories as Venice or coastal areas or regions, one of the approaches that we should start considering uh, is to abandon territories, losing economies, losing culture, losing heritage, and so on. Uh, this is something which is already happening uh, in, Oceania, in, uh, in Australia or into the Pacific Islands. At the, pre at the present moment, who's uh, as me and uh, my research team, um, we are trying to develop joint actions uh, to climate-proof our cities. Um, here we have a, a couple of local administrators, uh, regions, uh, you know how difficult it is to work with a short budget and to develop joint actions to adapt and to use and to develop a better and more sustainable city. So a lot has been done talking about re uh, reducing emissions uh, linking to transportation systems, but at the same time there is a, a huge lack in knowledge uh, and uh, in action to adapt uh, networks uh, for mobility. For mobility, this is uh, uh, for two main reasons. One is the extreme high cost for adapting uh, 
networks because to transform, to turn a mobility system into something different, it's easier, but to adapt a large network of streets, railways, is di totally different and definitely more costing. This gets even worse when we start talking about these typology of environments. When we start talking about heritage, when we start talking about very peculiar cities where you have uh, um, extreme impacts of climate change and at the same time you have a large and enormous economic interest in making those cities keep functioning even in um, difficult contexts. So far, where are we? Um, this is the output uh, of uh, the project which basically gets me here. Uh, which is the project SECAP, uh, which is an interact project developed uh, between Italy and Slovenia. Um, and for this, I also thank the partners of the project, which are the Ida Sands Park projects. Um, so far, we are at this point. So we developed the knowledge uh, to know where um, climate impacts can be distributed. This is uh, just uh, an example uh, of uh, the urban Italian impact. Uh, um, and this map basically shows uh, the different uh, um, patterns uh, of uh, temperature on a territory. From this, getting to uh, a municipality asking for, can we talk about developing appropriate adaptation strategies to, de to develop uh, a better urban solutions in a more efficient economic way uh, for the use of the economic resources, requires a... Uh, um, a, f a further step, which at the present moment is kind of difficult to be implemented, which is developing uh, strategies. So starting from the reality of uh, the territory and the distribution of the impacts, uh, it's difficult to get uh, to transversal, uh, transboundary planning strategies and planning approaches uh, which, which can support uh, um, the implementation of efficient adaptation strategies. This map basically shows uh, one of the attempt of this interreg of this interreg project, uh, trying to identify transboundary approaches and transboundary actions uh, along coastlines and uh, along uh, the Alps. Uh, the main output of the project has been the development of uh, uh, a set of uh, adaptation measures and adaptation strategies, but still we remain at the level of uh, the uh, exceptionality of the AU funded project. So we are still, um, we still have problems uh, in getting administrations uh, implement norms, uh, regulations based on these experiences. Um, the more advanced point that we are implementing into the city of Venice is basically this. So starting from the uh, remote sensed images, uh, so those frameworks uh, large scale which, which allow to um, coordinate vast and large territories, uh, we are trying to develop urban patterns uh, to assess and organize uh, um, cities uh, at the neighborhood scale. In this case, uh, on the left, uh, you can see, I mean, obviously it's a, a very large simplification of a three years uh, project, but those two, are urban patterns uh, um, of assessment, uh, assessment urban patterns, uh, which allows to map uh, and develop a knowledge uh, at the neighborhood scale uh, for urban Thailand uh, for flooding. This basically gets to this typology of maps uh, and assessment. Um, this is a data set developed based on Greenland cover uh, layers. So here we just mapped uh, commerce, uh, digging from Google the points where we had commerce, but we have also that linked to mobility, the one linked to social services, schools, houses. And this basically tells us where we have vulnerable services or where we have vulnerable infrastructures. And so this provides also priority for intervention. So considering that we have kind of short economic resources, this is the tool which allows to uh, implement uh, and to overlap uh, adaptation uh, to other typology of planning. For example, planning plans for public health, plans for homeland security, plans for coastal, uh, coastal protection. 
and to implement basically this, which is the three main core solutions uh, that at the, present at the present moment are available, uh, which is blue infrastructure, green infrastructure, and gray infrastructure, linking to specific and mapped uh, climate impacts. In this case, uh, uh, this is an extract from the project developed uh, uh, between Italy and uh, Slovenia. So you will find snow and ice, urban Italian, urban flooding, linking to the specific governance scale, which allows a perfect implementation, perfect, which allows an, the implementation of these three typology of action. At the same time, um, and this is the core of my presentation actually, um, we are uh, entering and we entered in a new period of EU funding and new programs. So far, we are trying to capitalize what we have done in the last seven years, but still we are working in a frame of exceptional actions. So still we are, uh, we are facing the difficult to uh, turn these exceptional projects into ordinary regulations, into a new paradigm for our territorial management. Um, so the core concept is that we should start working, obviously, um, I must apologize, uh, I am from Venice and this is kind of a, a representation of the Venetian culture, so we're going to export our model into all the Mediterranean, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but the three pillars which can allow the implementation and basically uh, turning this exceptionality into a new paradigm are governance, funding, and research. Obviously, research for me is the priority as I am a researcher, but at the same time, it bases also on cooperation. So this typology of event, and I really thank you for inviting me today, is the perfect moment to, and the perfect match, to start developing a new generation of EU-funded project, which aims not in a developing pilot actions, but developing a new paradigm for urban planning, because this is, in my opinion, the only solution to get to a real shifting in urban management towards the climate adaptation planning. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Um, I really hope that all of you, especially uh, local authorities, are not only taking notes, but thinking about how to bring this uh, extraordinary into ordinary in your own mobility planning, in your own urban planning. Um, and also to think about questions for later on when we will have uh, Q&A. So, um, our second speaker for today, um, should be at the back, uh, is Goran Lampey. Um, he has um, a traffic engineering background and he's a project coordinator of Audras, uh, Secretariat of CVNet Slovenia, Croatia, Southeast Europe. Um, Goran today will uh, present uh, sustainable urban mobility plan uh, plans as a tool to adapt to climate change, challenges and future perspectives. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thanks to the organizers for actually inviting us for uh, to present our work and our, in general, what we do in the work considering this project and SUMPs. Of course, uh, there will be a quite simple and fast uh, way to finish this presentation. Uh, you can see the topic of the presentation sums as a tool to adopt the climate change. Is it possible? Yes. The answer is really short. Yes, but obviously it's not working as it should. So few slides will follow. Uh, a brief overview about what I'm going to present today, just a few words about ODRAS and the similar network of uh, our network, the importance of sustainable mobility, EU context and trends, SUMPs, Climasum project, which is a EU, uh, German government funded project that we work on and is closely related to SUMPs. Some lessons learned for the, from the first part, uh, I can uh, I have to mentioned already now that uh, we are at the half of the project, so basically uh, some lessons are learned and then a brief conclusion. As mentioned, my name is Goran Lampid and I come from Zagreb, from Croatia, uh, work uh, for ODRAS, which is an abbreviation for Sustainable Community Development. So, civil society organization working with a list of all the 
mentioned civil society organizations, schools, uh, academic community, cities, municipalities, uh, professional business uh, organizations and networks and so on. Uh, the point is the list is actually the same as the ones that should be included while producing an SUMP. Uh, topics are quite broad, broader than just traffic. It's all about sustainability, it's about uh, urban rural mobility, uh, networking, development of civil society and so on. There are more than 90 projects we have already finished, performed, connected to sustainability and to sustainable development. One of those is also the Sivinet network. We are like Sivinet Cyprus, Greece, just Sivinet Slovenia, Croatia, Southeast Europe. And you know all about it, uh, about the network, so I won't go much into detail. It's a network of cities and other stakeholders involved in sustainable mobility planning and management. And that is how we actually promote sustainability as a, a, as a mode of life and as a mode of mobility through our network. We have more than 217 members in the network, which, of course, exchange knowledge, know-how, and so on. Why are we talking about sustainability and sustainable mobility? Benefits are vast, uh, from demographic recovery, especially in this rural area, which are not that uh, populated and well connected, over better quality of life, healthier society, and it helps in saving money. Stuff like helps in saving money is always good for politicians because if you mention them like 19 billion euros annually, which can be saved in case uh, some of the SUMP measures would be introduced, are always a good trigger to start changing things. Uh, this is also a brief answer, yes, uh, for the name of the presentation. Uh, since the 25% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the European Union uh, is, comes from uh, transport, of course, changing, uh, shifting uh, of, of the model share in uh, the cities and urban areas will, of course, significantly reduce the um, influence uh, transportation has on uh, climate change. EU context and trends are of course well, very well known. Uh, cities try, but despite the effort they still struggle in many areas. Uh, negative consequences, I will not mention them, we all know them, we know well are aware about the climate change and heat waves and so on. And even the evaluation uh, of the urban mobility package from 2013 highlighted seven, uh, several problems. The uh, one of the things was uh, that was highlighted was the insufficiently applied concept of SUMPs. Uh, mentioning that, that also is important because it's uh, noticeable that um, European Union is eager to finance SUMPs. Um, trends in the European Union are active mobility, walking and cycling, integrated passenger transportation systems, SUMPs, and of course shared mobility. The point is to be climate neutral by 2050. Without changing the paradigm, it will not be possible. And it's always good to bear in mind that a mobile person is not the one who owns the car, but the one who has quality infrastructure from cycling pedestrian infrastructure over uh, <coughs> an integrated passenger transportation system at its disposal. So this is also something that has to be bared in mind while making legislation and while making decisions on public spaces. Main measures are mentioned listed here, but the emphasis is again on SUMPs and mobility management plans. Uh, the rest of the presentation would be far too long to go through all of these. Uh, I believe that you are familiar with the uh, sustainable urban, urban mobility plans, ELTIS is the main European observa observation system, and I would say that uh, the SUMPs are actually um, the product of European Union, something that's now uh, spreading, uh, especially through North America, uh, where because the basic is that the focus on traffic and public transport uh, in public spaces is shifted to focus on people. In this way, we don't uh, use just uh, traffic engineers dominantly, or in planning is not doing, doing done by experts, but it's also uh, there is interdisciplinary planning teams, and planning involves stakeholders and citizens. So, uh, including stakeholders, all the stakeholders is very very important for SUMPs. There are eight principles, but as you can see, uh, planning sustainable mobility in a, function, a functional area, urban area, is something of huge importance. And at this moment, European Union is considering that SUMPs should cover a wider area, not just 
uh, a certain town because most of the traffic, as you will see in the following slide, comes from a wider functional area and not just in between the town. The point is the pyramid on the right. We have at this moment in most of the towns we have the cars as a basis of mobility while it should be otherwise. And although you have all seen this pyramid many times, not much has been changed, at least uh, in many parts of Europe. Benefits are, of course, uh, big. Again, more att attractive places to work, live and work, healthier and pleasant, uh, in, uh, more pleasant environment, availability for all. Um, I mentioned that EU is rethinking that the area that some uh, cover should be expanded because on the example of Bremen, there's this approximation that uh, more than 70% of commuters use cars. And then they stay, still again, you have traffic congestions and problems in the, in the cities. Measures are, of course, individual for each city, and this is also something that has shown in the Climasum project, again, an abbreviation of climate mitigation through sustainable urban mobility. The point is to put a concept of SUMPs in the focus of the area where the project is performed, and that's Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Besides Odras, we have two implementing partners, uh, Center for Environment from Banja Luka from Bosnia and Transport Research Center from Brno. Target groups is actually the same as the target groups of uh, each SUMP should be. It's not always the fact, and we all, um, any times we notice that actually the um, uh, SUMPs didn't cover all the stakeholders they should while producing them. Uh, the main obje objective is, of course, to uh, improve coordination of networks for sustainable mobility, improve understanding of capacity gaps, and increase capacity and knowledge among the stakeholders. This is one of the points we have noticed until now that are really, really weak uh, concerning the production and uh, later on uh, monitoring the SUMPs and, uh, of course, uh, evaluating ev evaluation of uh, SUMPs. All the photographs on the right are actually from Slovenia, which is the most advanced country considering the SUMPs of the three countries I will talk about. There are three, uh, there are four pillars of uh, project. Uh, first is the capacity development uh, to empower the towered groups. Uh, then there is the current state analysis and sustainable mobility policy development, education and training, and smart and sustainable mobility awareness rising. All these are the things that actually lack while uh, in the SMPs that were performed in the region the project uh, covers. Uh, at this moment, this uh, number two is more or less finished. Um, we are not still done with this uh, guidebook or handbook on how to uh, produce something, some uh, changes in SUMPs and how to uh, have the indicators. But uh, we have the analysis and uh, this, is, uh, this is the first lesson learned from the project. The situation in these three countries is that Slovenia is, of course, most advanced. 212 municipalities, 19 SUMPs, but more than 75% of uh, inhabitants live in these 90 municipalities. Croatia, much more municipalities, far less SUMPs. Bosnia and Herzegovina, same thing. Uh, the photographs from Slovenia are here simply because uh, they did a lot. They did many things concerning for, uh, you all probably heard about Ljubljana and the way they changed the, their center. But still, what is lacking, the model share I was talking about earlier is lacking. Uh, the, the, model sh shifting, uh, sorry, the model shift of the model share is lacking. So many, most of the people still are using the cars and all these great, I would always recommend to visit Slovenia and cycle, all these great cycling paths are quite many times empty, and that's one of the problems. So out of this, uh, when we notice that actually, obviously, although they implement some SMPs, some things are obviously not done properly since the, they are not the changes we would expect them to happen. I would give just uh, some bulletins as a conclusion, and these are the first part that we noticed how to, uh, what should be changed. Citizens and decision makers, of course. Citizens are the ones that vote. Citizens are the ones that de de demand, on one part, better public spaces, public spaces for uh, citizens, not for cars. On the other side, uh, working with them and uh, raising the awareness is really a tough job, fun job, but it depends, of course, uh, on how you approach them. It also depends on um, uh, social media, you have to 
be very careful because you can get some negative uh, comment on the social media thanks to the beautiful algorithms, then you are in a problem. You also have to make them aware about the problem, about the possibilities. Uh, decision makers, they, de they are depending on the citizens, on their vote. Uh, most of the decision makers, that would be, of course, the uh, mayors and so, are clueless on SUMPs and on stuff like that, especially in the area we are talking about. And some who know something, they need actually a push, they need a help from either civil society or networks to uh, start moving in the right direction. And with talking to uh, citizens, these unpopular measures might be actually better. Uh, now the rest of the, in the indicators, of course, have to be followed. Uh, the process has to be monitored. Uh, the, the decision makers have to go have idea about funding possibilities, how to get the money, is it possible to get the money from the state budget or for the European Union, and so on. Traffic modeling. Now this is a problem, but it was uh, actually part of SUMPs in Croatia. Meaning if you do a standard traffic modeling, you get uh, an answer which is it's scientific okay, but then you get the information and the data that shows that some road has to be uh, wider and new road has to be constructed, which is an opposite thing to SUMPs. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a traffic modeling, you can easily get some money from the state budget, so that's why probably they are still doing it. Parking spaces have to be considered in uh, smaller municipalities, but in order not to kill the city center or the center of a small municipality. On the other side, they shouldn't be also maybe a part of uh, SUMPs. And the last thing, predict and provide or decide and provide. Predict and provide is the actual way how it was done until now. So basically, uh, you make the traffic model, you predict the traffic volumes, and then you provide the solution so that there are no congestions, meaning more roads. Decide and provide is actually the way an SUMP has to be done. We have to decide what should be the model share of uh, in 20 years, 30 years of cycling of uh, pedestrians. We have to decide how, uh, what is the way we want our towns to look like, our cities, our public spaces, and then we provide the measures to solve that. Otherwise, we will not, we will simply just be in a loop and have more and more roads. Basically, uh, the ones that are against such measures usually are the ones who have never uh, lived in a town where they are implemented since it's not possible to move all or relocate all uh, citizens from one position to uh, for one year to such a town i think that many talking will have to be done with the citizens in order to start implementing SUMPs and to make proper measures for SUMPs thank you very much for your attention thank you goran Okay, so after investigating and assessing the situation of Mediterranean cities and seeing how uh, SUMPs can be used as a tool um, to match the relation between their carbonization and the fight against climate change, we will move towards a different word, which is the word of policy. That at times, I know, uh, working in policy can be and can seem far away from the actual activities of local authorities. But it is very much not like that. Um, we will start with uh, the last policy brief that we have developed on climate change, and for that I will invite our uh, next speaker, uh, Fabio Tomasi from Aria Sans Park. He is the manager of the Project Development and Management Unit at Aria Sans Park, and indeed he is one of the authors of uh, our policy brief on climate change and re resilience. So please, Fabio. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks. Okay, good morning everybody. So, uh, we have just developed a policy brief on uh, the, how mobility planning should adapt to, to climate change to make cities more resilient, especially mobility more resilient. The policy brief has finished, uh, has not been released yet, just some uh, working on layouts. It will be available very soon. Uh, how it has been developed? We involved, uh, well, we start with the review of scientific literature, we interview the experts, and then we add uh, experts on different uh, fields, uh, as for example, Carlo, that you met before. Uh, interact together in order to understand which are the impacts of mobility, of climate change mobility, and 
which action should be taken. So, uh, why this policy brief? There's a common understanding that the key priority is working on mitigation. In other words, preventing or at least limiting the climate change. But it is important as well to uh, work uh, on adaptation, on taking measures to make our cities more resilient and reduce the impact that climate change has on our cities. To make a comparison, it's like this building. To prevent fire, probably, you want this uh, building to be the infrastructure to be fire resistant. You want the materials to be not flammable. You want to have uh, um, rules that prevent you to light fire or take inflammable materials inside. But probably you will not be happy about that. You will feel safer if also there's an evacuation plan, if there are extinguishers. And uh, so, getting back to climate change, the difference with our buildings is, well, in climate change, we are already the fire inside the building. Climate change is already hitting us. When we were writing this policy brief during the summer, we had a lot of examples of all, all of that we were writing down. So it, we are not speaking about uh, a distant future. It's already the present happening. So which are the main impacts of climate change on uh, our cities? Sea level rise, floods, heavy precipitation, extreme wide, extreme heat waves, uh, and uh, wildfires. Even if wildfire does not directly impact a city, usually, uh, it still having a wildfire very close to the city center with disrupt uh, the mobility from uh, the surrounding village, uh, villages, other cities, and uh, so disrupt the mobility of commuters. Um, well, in the policy brief, you will find uh, a lot of suggestions. They are arranged according uh, to each of the impact. Uh, they have been prioritized at different levels, must, the most important, uh, should, and can. And uh, each one of them, there are different levels of intervention, local, regional, national, and European level. Unfortunately, I have limited time today. I can just uh, give you some key messages. And, but I invite you to subscribe to our newsletter and have a look at our website and download the guide as soon as it will be available to read the whole the list of suggestions that you will find there. As a general remark, well, I will start with the consideration of when you are investing on uh, uh, infrastructure related to climate change, when you work for example, if you invest uh, on uh, energy efficiency, then you will have a cash back from that. If you invest uh, on uh, sustainable mobility, as it has be just been presented, you have an improved quality of life in uh, your city. If you invest on preventing a disaster to happen, hopefully nothing will happen. And uh, there's a problem of perception of just invest in. So it's important to, to communicate with your citizens why this infrastructure is important. Uh, but on the way, you should be aware and make your citizens aware that if that infrastructure will not be present in case of, of an extreme uh, event, uh, then there would have been a disaster. And this is not easily perceived. So working on communication, explaining, is extremely important to get uh, uh, acceptance and support. Then also another issue is uh, the lack of financial resources, which is uh, a common uh, um, element of uh, all uh, intervention, and also a lack of understanding, knowledge, and uh, capacity of local authorities. So some of the recommendations, the first step is, first of all, to make an assessment of which is the level of risk in your specific 
city and surrounding areas. Climate change has different level of impact and can impact uh, differently different regions. So you have to understand which is the risk and which area are at major risk. Um, and you should also understand which will be the trend in future. You should not plan as uh, everything will be the same. If you are planning for an infrastructure that will last 30 years, you should ask yourself how will be the situation in 30 years. It will be different. So that should be taken into consideration. And so that means incorporating climate risk into mobility planning. Um, awareness raising is important, as I said. Then uh, you should think about different adaptation uh, measures. Uh, Carlo has already presented there are different options that could be consider also abandoning some areas, you should make cost-benefit analysis, not terms in economic terms, but also considering the relevance and the impact it has on mobility, but also the cultural value. There could be some area in the cities that has a particular cultural value or is already part of the life of citizens and you may right wish to invest more to protect it. Um, then the use of green infrastructure is important since it can help us a lot of mitigating the impacts of uh, climate change. You should also consider um, what means the maintenance of these green areas, especially in terms of uh, use of water. Um, but you can choose also um, plants that need less water. But this is something to take into consideration since water is a scarce resource. Uh, and as I say, the mitigation action should always take interaction. Um, you should also plan in a way to make active mobility as much as possible still uh, possible and convenient even in case of uh, extreme weather events, extreme heat. Uh, in the Mediterranean areas, probably what one of the several reasons that prevent people from active mobility is not really cold snow or rain, which happens, but it's mostly the heat or warm weather extremely. So, uh, you should protect the infrastructure for uh, climate change uh, by considering, uh, for example, raising the entrance uh, uh, of underground uh, infrastructure, uh, renovate uh, or relocate some of uh, the infrastructure to safer area to prevent floods that could be considered by generated by every precipitation or by the level of sea level rise. Uh, that, uh, the adoption of nature-based uh, solution is uh, also important. And, uh, and also improving real-time traffic information and uh, um, early warning system is crucial. Um, sometimes uh, these Extreme weather events are uh, very quick in time and it very quickly. So it's important to spread the information to your citizens as, as quick as, and as wide as possible. New technologies help you that could, you can have uh, generally uh, automated, uh, connected uh, sensors that can indicate uh, in real time uh, where an underground uh, has been flooded and get the information close that uh, way and uh, so on. Findable, you sh should plan uh, in a flexible and a resilient way. Uh, that means you should have uh, several options close to you. Um, I made the example of the wildfire. This summer we had close to my seat in Trieste, a large wildfire, 
and uh, the, both the railroad and the main roads were closed due to the fire. So it had to be arranged an emergency services for ferry that by the sea uh, were able to take the commuters to the city and back. So you should have different options to make your cities and mobility more re resilient in order to, to maintain the quality of life of our citizens. So I uh, will be available also during the coffee break if you want to ask me and uh, I invite you to download our policy brief. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fabio. Okay, so before moving uh, to the last presentation, which also coincides to the end of the first part of our session that will be followed by a Q&A, I would like to say that we worked, again, I mentioned this before, on multiple policy briefs. This one was the fourth one, and it was dedicated to, indeed, climate change, as you heard from Fabio. But also we worked on electromobility. We worked as well on... Um, um, uh, on soft mobility and tourism. And the last presentation of the first session is actually dedicated to our very first uh, policy brief by Christos Giolalis. Um, this policy brief was dedicated to uh, soft mobility, which is not entirely the same thing as active mobility, but we will investigate that maybe later. Uh, Christos uh, holds a diploma in civil engineering and a PhD in transportation, and he works at CiviNet, uh, Cyprus, and Greece. And please, come, come ahead. Good morning. My name is Christos Giolidasis, and uh, we will speak about the first policy brief prepared about a, a year ago. It covers the topic of soft mobility. So, to begin with, as it was mentioned by our project officer, Ludwig Lafontaine, uh, this project mainstreams the good practices developed in the interregment funded projects of uh, the previous uh, funding period. To produce the policy brief, we used evidence collected by good practices developed in such modular projects. You can see some of them here. Uh, we have Barcelona and the Great Bicivia Network, which highlighted the need for coordination, assessment, and maintenance. Then we also had uh, the case of uh, Misano, which highlighted the need for guidance, signage, and monitoring. Moreover, we also had the case of Zadar in Croatia, which uh, highlighted the need to promote the cycling culture and also to collect data about soft mobility. Last but not least, we had the cases of Igumenica and Dures, which covered mostly infrastructure development and highlighted the need to have a coordinated approach among all local stakeholders and, of course, the need to maintain the, the projects developed. In addition to these four case studies, we also had the mentoring cases, uh, which uh, some of them covered soft mobility. Me the mentoring cases were mentioned earlier by Cosmos Anagnostopoulos. We had the city of, uh, we had Sfax in Tunisia, we had uh, Larnaca in Cyprus and Palini in Greece, which learned through, through such good practices developed in modular projects. So, based on all this, we put together a policy brief. Uh, I will present to you uh, only some of the recommendations. Uh, the first one is to consider infrastructure quality. This was highlighted in many cases I mentioned earlier. Uh, there is a widespread, uh, a widespread belief that soft mobility is a low-cost intervention that is limited only to paint the road. This is not the case, actually. Uh, it has been found out, uh, looking at all the evidence, that first of all, it is very essential to protect the pedestrians from the uh, bicyclists, because the pedestrians are very, very vulnerable, and, the, and they can get uh, very seriously injured in the case of an incident. We also found out that it is very, very important to consider parking facilities like shelters, charging dogs, and hubs, 
where people can leave their, uh, their soft vehicles. Uh, as we are in the Mediterranean, it was found most notably in the case of Larnaca that it is very important to have shadowed areas because in the summer it gets very, very warm. So uh, people will be discouraged to actually drive their bicycles or scooters or whatever because they uh, do not uh, want to be exposed to the sun. Uh, also, another very important issue for road safety is to clearly define priorities and inter at intersections so that the potential of conflicts gets reduced. Now, let me go on to the next, uh, to the next recommendation. Uh, it is about involving local stakeholders. It is very important as essentially, as we have seen in many projects, the opposition of local stakeholders or the public opinion to such projects might derail them. Uh, it should be highlighted to everyone involved that uh, there are significant benefits by the development of soft mobility measures and of course to always take into, into consideration the opinion of local stakeholders at the planning process and most notably when new projects are built there should be a consideration of soft mobility so that you will not have to build, uh, for instance, the infrastructure later that would uh, make the costs skyrocket compared to building them in advance. Another very important topic is the network effect, which highlights the need to foster collaboration among municipalities. We've seen this in Barcelona. Once the network was complete and the people could actually use their bicycles to travel long uh, distances, uh, the ridership increased. We suggest to do that by establishing working groups and memoranda of understanding among neighboring communities and to facilitate exchanges and provide financial incentives to common projects, but also to ensure the long-term continuity of these discussions as usually we've seen some of them but they were only limited at the very beginning of the projects at the approval and not eventually in the uh, full development of the project. Now another very important topic is training users and non-users. Uh, while it might be easily understood for uh, the users of uh, bicycles and soft mobility modes that they need some training in order to know how to uh, actually use their uh, bicycles or scooters while uh, moving around in a city. It's also important for car users who might, uh, who need to be aware of the existence of other soft mobility, of soft mobility modes, but also of staff. It has been found that even though some municipalities might have had the goodwill to promote soft mobility, there was not institutional capacity inside the cities and eventually it was difficult to make things move forward. We have heard lots of uh, the two majors who have spoken earlier. Uh, and uh, finally, let me uh, show the last uh, recommendation which we'll show today. Uh, we highlight the need to provide financial support. There is a misconception that uh, it is a very low cost solution, but it is needed actually to fund not only at the SAMP level, we've heard about the SAMPs from Goran Lampey, uh, however the SAMPs are at strategic level. There is also need for funding at, for, at development and most of all maintenance, because we have seen that maintenance has been a challenge even for uh, Barcelona, which was the largest city and the most successful one, but still they had issues with this as no uh, funding was earmarked for maintenance. So we suggest to provide financial in incentives, but as I said, not only for studies, but also implementation and maintenance, to earmark soft mobility related funding in EU and national frameworks about mobility and to provide direct, directive incentives to users to acquire uh, e-vehicles, for instance, and to get free access and parking to regulated areas. So, as I said earlier, these are only some of the recommendations uh, that uh, are presented in the policy brief. 
please follow us in our, on our website, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, you can follow us at uh, the community newsletter. Uh, you can find there the policy brief. This is its front page. Uh, it is available in English, in French, and in Greek. Uh, we hope soon that we will have them in Italian too, and hopefully Albanian and uh, Spanish, so that uh, even more people will be able to read it and uh, get informed uh, about the experiences that we had in the urban transport community and how this can pave a way to uh, promote soft mobility in the Mediterranean. So, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, this kind of wraps up uh, the beginning of our session and now we can move on to the second part. So I will ask all the speakers to come back on stage and to sit around here. Uh, we'll start the Q&A, and while uh, you guys are joining us, Christos and Goran as well, um, I would like to say two things. So we talked about policy briefs, all policy briefs, even the draft ones, so the fourth one, are available outside uh, for the time being, um, so please grab a copy. Um, in terms of presentations, presentations will be available after the conference. Um, but feel free also to talk with our speakers. Um, they're available uh, throughout these days and I think it's very important that if you have any questions and maybe you don't feel uh, at ease asking them right now, um, you may feel at ease to do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis throughout the two days that we have together. So, um, before asking questions on my side, I would like to thank you all. Um, your presentations were very interesting and thank you for sharing your knowledge and your competence with us. Um, do we have any question? Okay, we move on. Uh, we actually prepared a couple questions. Um, so I would start with one question for Carlo. Oh. Okay, I think it's, <laughs> it's the microphone, okay. Um, I will start with a question with, uh, for you. Um, the first one will be, uh, what will be the main impacts of climate change on urban mobility in Mediterranean cities? I mean, I definitely would link to uh, Fabio's presentation because he outlined uh, those which are the main impacts recognized even by IPCC and by the new covenant of mayors. And, those are the impacts, but the point is not can we list uh, or can we outline a list of possible impacts, but the point is uh, are these impacts going to overlap? And that's the difficult part, because talking about urban Italian, talking about flooding, talking about uh, wildfires uh, requires a knowledge of the morphology of the territory, because at the same time having an impermeable surface is going to trigger multiple impacts at the same time. Not just, okay, we can have our perfect list, but that list is not going to be enough, definitely. So we need more detailed tools to understand our cities. Okay, okay. So you talked about Carlos' presentation, um, Fabio's presentation, sorry. Um, so I would probably move uh, to Fabio, asking a question to you. Um, you talked about infrastructures, um, but how do you think active mobility will be influenced by climate change. Yeah. Indeed, uh, active mobility can be in danger due to climate change. Um, you can imagine that uh, moving uh, during an extreme heat wave uh, could be extremely uncomfortable or even dangerous. Uh, so it is important, and this was also mentioned by Christos, uh, that is important to have shading, resting areas with trees, water fountains, some seat to raise. But it's not only about extreme heat, it's also about floods and extreme rain. So it is important to protect these roads, increase the level, not for them to be flooded. Um, to have, uh, in case, uh, barriers to protect by extreme wind. This is something, again, as Carlo said, you 
have uh, this are general remarks, but you have to understand which are the criticalities in your area and uh, act accordingly. Okay, absolutely, it does make sense. Um, so you talked about uh, Christos and what you said and mentioned about soft mobility, but as I mentioned before, soft mobility may not be exactly the same thing as active mobility. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yes. Active mobility involves uh, physical, uh, you know, physical exercise. People are using a bike, for instance. When you use an e-bike, uh, of course, there's assistance and, uh, by the battery and by the uh, mechanism of uh, the vehicle so that, you don't, so that you can ride longer distances. Today, mo many of us had the pleasure to walk around this area, go uphill, go downhill. <laughs> so it might have been a bit difficult and physically challenging for some people. These, uh, especially for vulnerable people. So soft mobility actually are modes that enable and are particularly important for this type of users. Okay, well, thank you. So, um, since we talked about uh, we need much more than just a list to tackle climate change, and we need to address the characteristics of your city or your region or your area, and we talked about the importance of soft mobility in this, I would like to go back to Goran and uh, to SUMPs, because SUMPs kind of encompass a lot of activities and they're a perfect tool and a perfect example on how to not just make a list. It's much more than that and it encompasses m multiple plans at once. Um, and the question is, how um, can we put all the strategic plans together and is it worth doing that? And how can uh, SUMPs be instrumental for that? Yeah, I think uh, definitely it's possible to do something like this and it should be done because uh, SMPs, as you mentioned, are more than that. They are, for example, not just looking at uh, the traffic flow or at, uh, for example, somebody who is a civil engineer would check whether the road is wide enough or uh, strong enough for that traffic and so on and so on. This is a much wider uh, area of expertise required from uh, architecture uh, arch architects over uh, urbanists over um, landscape designers so so many things are actually happening you also have to have a uh, sociologist uh, at uh, also on the team because the public space is a public space and as we can see in most of the, the cities especially the Med mediterranean ones where you have this uh, urban area which is quite dense and you have uh, a limited space between uh, the buildings and then we obviously decide uh, willingly to use two thirds of them for cars and afterwards of course everything uh, gets warm uh, in the summer the temperatures rises there is no place for trees and stuff like that so basically yes uh, the, it's interdisciplinary and SUMPs can um, cover all these fields in, uh, in order to get uh, a better result. But of course, a better result which, uh, con which should include uh, communication with citizens, because every, uh, what I already mentioned in the presentation, everybody would, will say, yeah, that's a great thing to have uh, new trees planted in the streets. But when they, they are planted in front of their buildings and they lose some parking spaces, then they get mad. And then you have to you know, work with them a lot. But it surely is something which is kind of strategy above uh, looking a little bit further than uh, than the normal u usual traffic for example yes. solutions yes I, I think you mentioned something um, about the strategy itself but you mentioned a lot about public and the general uh, population but I think it's also a lot about uh, political engagement and this actually um, may go back to Carlo do you think that policymakers, but also it's open to all of you, do you think that policymakers are actually engaged into uh, making changes and understand the impact of climate change? Uh, shall I reply yeah, go ahead. honestly? Yeah, of course. No, no, sir. Slap in the face, absolutely. Not, not all, <laughs> mostly not. I mean, Goran, you said something before, which is uh, citizen votes, uh, so decision makers, you must engage. So it's also about that. It's uh, um, about the three pillars because uh, 
we can fund the money, we can develop researches, but then there is a governance. And governance uh, complies with uh, citizen desires. Somehow, uh, sometimes it's bad, some, most of the time should be good. And we talked before about bottom up and top down. So uh, at the same time, uh, to make a decision maker understand, uh, you should make citizens understand, and then you can talk with them. Mm. Okay. Do you have other opinions here? <laughs> no, we obviously agree because, uh, yeah, the, as I mentioned already before, the politicians, some are clueless, some are afraid to make the changes because they, will, they are afraid that they will lose the elections next time. And that's one of the, not, of course, not everybody. But the thing is that they have to, obviously, this bottom-up approach and people have to push them. And if uh, people are aware that uh, there are external costs of uh, uh, transportation and that the car doesn't cost per kilometer as much as uh, they think that it does, but it costs, costs much more and they're paying it through tax, uh, taxes, so the taxpayers cover all the uh, damages from the climate, climate changes and all these uh, catastrophic uh, fires and so on. At that moment when the uh, average citizen will realize that, then he will reconsider to move by car or by bike or by train. So definitely I agree with you. It's sure the bottom-up approach does uh, work uh, in this moment. Okay, okay. So, um, well, I don't want to really change topic, but also at the same time, I think we will we'll have to go back to um, the geographic scope also of this session. Because when we talk about climate change, of course, we have to remember that we are also looking at it from the Mediterranean perspective. And I think that Christos and Fabio can also pitch in in this, uh, especially when it comes down to coastal areas. Like, what is the major impact for coastal areas in the Mediterranean when it comes down to climate change? Yeah, coastal areas are particularly at risk. And when we are speaking about coastal areas in the Mediterranean, is where most of the population lives. Uh, and uh, there are areas that are particularly low, especially if there are touristic resorts. Uh, and uh, when uh, the sea level will rise, uh, they will be highly impacted. Uh, so the increase of sea level rise uh, as, uh, in the long term means that the level of the sea rise and will inundate permanently some areas if there are not take an action, but it means also that uh, now it, they are more vulnerable to uh, storms uh, and uh, particularly <coughs> sorry uh, high waves that can inundate temporarily, and uh, this is swift. It's not something that is easily perceived by people, mm -hmm. so it is important to communicate and raise awareness, because this is something new. It reminds me of what Carlo mentioned about Oceania, Oceania like Australia. Uh, are we bound to be basically like Australia in the Mediterranean, kind of? That is the kind of impression that I'm having, but um, do you think that is actually a scenario? Uh, possible scenario for that. Actually, I mean, uh, we are, three of us uh, came from the Adriatic Sea, and so it is, uh, I don't know if you come also from the Adriatic region. Okay. Uh, but the point is, uh, the Adriatic and the Mediterranean are two narrow seas, and at the present moment, the IPCC forecasts are actually developed at the Atlantic scale, or in general, the, uh, in um, uh, oceanic scale. So develop scenarios uh, for our uh, seas uh, saying, okay, sea level rise is going to be a problem at the end of this century is kind of complicated. But definitely what Fabio said is uh, the main point, uh, which is, uh, okay, in 100 years, we're going to be covered by water. Who knows? But at the present moment, we know that we have an increase uh, in extreme storm surge, uh, coastal erosions, which is already ongoing. And uh, Inside the Adriatic Basin, uh, we don't know that if we don't cooperate between uh, Croatia, Slovenia, Italy, we are going to split the same impacts uh, without stopping that, basically. Because what is going to impact uh, Trieste is going to impact Pola. What is going to impact uh, Ancona is going to impact Zadar. And so, sharing strategies. Uh, okay. 
makes sense, absolutely. And by sharing strategies also, I think, I'm going back also to Christos and soft mobility. Um, there's, of course, you have probably uh, a more, um, a, a bigger focus on islands, but also in general, how, how do you think soft mobility can be a game changer in the strategy and can really make, uh, yeah, make a change for, uh, like in terms of the looming situation of climate change? Yes. So, uh, the impact of climate change has been so, th has been so thoroughly uh, described by Fabio and Carlo. We, expect, we hope that uh, soft mobility will indeed be a game changer. This could happen uh, through, of course, the reduction of the emissions, but also uh, th th by, by giving more public space to the people to use. Uh, and of course, uh, this would be particularly important in case uh, of, uh, as I said earlier, uh, vulnerable people, because they need to have ways to uh, transfer and perhaps the current policies might lead to transport poverty to them. So this is one issue to be taken into consideration. Now, the benefits of soft mobility regarding climate change are of course very visible. Even in the case of electric uh, bicycles or e-scooters, if you check at the life cycle assessment studies, they indeed give the opportunity to lower the total uh, emissions, even at the production stage, compared to heavy vehicles. And all studies indicate that once you replace car traffic, you indeed reduce the uh, emissions and eventually mitigate some of the effects of the climate change. Yes? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for your uh, in-depth analysis. It was very uh, technical and very informational. Uh, although I, I tend to understand that the discussion is circulated again and again around the same uh, vicious question that nobody has managed to, to answer so far adequately. Uh, the, the Technocrats speak very technical, and the politicians are acting very political. So it's like having two communities talking different languages. How easy is to implement all those fantastic changes into the neighborhoods? Have you ever tried it? If you try it, you see that, that the resistance that you get from the, from the citizens, the resistance to change, which is a natural ingredients of our DNA, eh? okay. it is very, very difficult to cope with. So I think that the first effort that we have to make is to start making, convincing the technocrats thinking a bit political and the politicians to start thinking a little bit technical. Otherwise, uh, we will consider your work very theoretical and unrealistic, and you will consider our job as uh, vote collective processes, which is not what you want and is not what we want. So just this comment is because we live with it on a daily basis throughout our, uh, our uh, term of, uh, in office. Thank you. I, I kind of agree. Uh, like, uh, I, I totally actually agree in, in a way. On the other hand, the word of climate change and as well as the word of politics are complex and simple at the same time in many, many ways. Um, I don't think um, research can be dumbed down at times to be um, more understood. I think that, of course, there's a need to engage more between, like, have peer-to-peer -peer review and understand each other a little bit better, but um, I think it's, it, it's as you mentioned, um, trying to balance it out between the different parts, including also citizens. And that starts from educating also everyone into understanding that climate change, as also what Fabio mentioned uh, before, is not future, is not incoming, is not the next day, the next decade, it's now, <laughs> it's yesterday. It's like years and years ago. Um, I don't know if you have comments or do you want to reply? Yes. Just uh, something, um, we have talked about citizens and, you know, the, 
um, the difficulty to change the habits and, and to take all this into account. And I'm talking from the program view for the next uh, program period or the, the, the one, the upcoming. It's just there is a parameter also that uh, we cannot master very well. It's just the, the, the wave of tourists uh, when they come. Because, you know, sometimes the citizens, they, they agree to make some efforts for their cities. And then when they come, the waves of tourists doing anything, you know, uh, they say, okay, well, I cannot take my car, but they're just, they, they're coming and this, they, they're overflowing all the parking lots and so on. And just, so I think that there's also a, a challenge here that will have to be tackled. It's just that first is handling um, the citizens within the city and trying to plan and the, 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 the sums are, are there, but thinking about the daily routine and the daily life, but it's true that when you have the seasonality of uh, tourism coming in, it's something additional uh, that complicates also uh, the solutions that we can um, uh, implement. So uh, I think it will be very challenging and I'm looking forward to see that um, all the results and everything that you presented here could be also applied in the field of tourism uh, for the sustainability of tourism and also sustainability of, uh, of our um, for cities to uh, well thank you first of all but to this regard also we have a policy brief so with some recommendations that are a bit uh, that are a little bit more catered towards tourism and the interaction of uh, what we've been doing but absolutely is very is a very very valid point um, as like when we're talking about Mediterranean we cannot not think about tourism as well as a big component so, um, do you have uh, final comments uh, for yourselves, or um, can I maybe ask one last question to all of you, like collective? You're nodding? Okay, fantastic. So, um, to wrap it up, what would you wish uh, cities and city representatives uh, would do, or could do, or you may do for them uh, in the future, also considering what, like, the comments that were made? in terms of, of course, the topic of climate change and decarbonization. Okay. We hope that uh, the cities, along with civil society organizations and technical e experts, can launch participatory processes that will take into account the interests and uh, the opinions of all stakeholders involved, starting from the citizens, but also the business people, as well as, of course, the tourism industry to see how eventually they can find a way to uh, merge all of them and eventually present the best soft mobility solutions for the cities they represent. Great. Do we have more comments? Maybe, Carla? Yeah, go ahead. Microphone works. Yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. Now, I really would like to, to reply to your question, uh, replying to yours, uh, because uh, most of the time we do blame. Uh, it, it's true. It's definitely true. We blame uh, politicians uh, because we say it's your fault, because we find that there is an inertia on the decision maker side. Uh, but you pointed out the really core of the problem, which is the paradox, because at the same time we do desire to develop bottom-up actions, uh, increasing citizen uh, awareness and so on, but at the same time, we do need uh, the support of decision makers uh, in a top -down, with a top-down approach. What I mentioned before, which is uh, we need to define uh, new regulations, uh, uh, is not something which, hap which happens bottom-up. It's something which must be decided at a certain point with uh, an, ex an acceptance rate uh, from citizen, which should be high, otherwise uh, you're going to find a bunch of difficult uh, at the neighborhood scale implementing just a bench or planting two trees. So it's a combination of, the two, of these two things. So from my perspective, the, my desires is to work more along with the cheesy makers. I mean, basing on these three pillars. And maybe money, obviously, is the thing which is going to make us work together. Funding. Funding. <laughs> Got it? Well, I will uh, continue uh, on your answer. Uh, the same. Well, first of all, I uh, agree with uh, the thing that it's, uh, of course, that it's not easy to always to be a politician. But since you are already here, that means that you are uh, really familiar with uh, traffic and mobility issues and with all the stuff. 
Um, but uh, when I was referring to some problems where, where the bottom-up approach would function better, is uh, let's be honest, we all know about some cases when somebody uh, is put to a position, for example, communal position, where he or she decides about putting a bench. And then you put a bench next to a cycling path, which doesn't really make any sense. And th there are many small measures which could be done in a better way if they would uh, decide better. For example, we have now a situation in Croatia where we uh, decided not to, uh, uh, put, to put a new railway line from priority number one to priority number two after a fast road, a state road, which is completely wrong and completely unnecessary. So we have many, uh, of course, education, uh, both for the citizens, but also both for uh, the politicians is necessary. And of course, without uh, help from the politicians, it won't be as easy to influence, uh, it won't be as easy for us to influence the uh, citizens because uh, what we experienced is that we worked with citizens a lot and then politicians came, the citizens gave some information, some idea and uh, afterwards nothing happened. And that's the moment when you lose the interest of the publicity to uh, speak up and to try to change something. So uh, it's, uh, it goes both ways for sure and it would be great, what I would wish is that uh, um, some simple measures without you know, a new uh, application for this and then uh, 21st application for that, it would be really, really nice to have a functioning clean trains, a functioning public transportation system, uh, which will also solve some of the problems in the Adriatic coast or in the Mediterranean. If you have one ticket, if you, the people do not, the tourists do not need to come by car. If they have uh, reasonable cycling paths, uh, aero velo routes and so on. You would start changing these things and afterwards, if you offer this to the people, then you can easily, with the help of politicians, enroll the, that, the one that pollutes pace. And then I don't have a problem if you could drive by car uh, for 100 meters, but you pay. That would be it. Yeah. Okay. Fabio, do you have a last comment? Yeah. I would answer to both your question and the comment from the mayor by saying not only what the cities should do, but also what we should do for cities. I mean, uh, uh, cities has a crucial role, but they should not be left alone. There's regional and national government should support them with uh, uh, a policy framework. Uh, scientific center should support them with a, a usable knowledge. Um, climate change is extremely complex. Cities cannot deal with it alone. We should all work together also in fooling the right message because otherwise if uh, the mayor will take an action to prevent something. People will not understand and say, which is a waste of money. If he doesn't invest, then there's the flutes, and then the people in the streets down with the mayor that it's his fault that, that there's the flutes. So we should really support cities. They are the key actors, but they cannot be left alone because they have limited the resources, both in terms of financial resources, man force, and knowledge. And I think on that note, we can wrap it up. Um, thank you so much again for your contribution and for this very nice dialogue. I hope that if you have questions, you are going to jump them right uh, after and <laughs> during our break so that you can get all your questions answered. Thank you so much and I'll see you later. <laughs>